Well, we welcome everybody to another installment of Ministers Joe and Josh Discuss. We will be in Genesis 31, beginning in verse 17 today. Things are getting interesting in the story of Jacob. He's finished his 14 years of work for his two wives. He had a negotiation, which we talked about last week with Laban, about what his wages should be. And who knows how long he worked with these wages, but he has really profited. And uh, now he's at a point where he's ready to go home. And uh, he feels not cheated because the Lord has made sure that he has benefited from every one of Laban's attempts to take advantage of him. But he does know that Laban is uh, without, he's unbounding in his energy and creativity and how he might defraud Jacob. At least that's the way he's presented. Yeah. It never works. Um, but he, he seems to be constantly trying to do that. And Jacob's finally had his fill. And he, we've always known he had to go back to the, to the Holy Land. He has to go back to Canaan. That's the land that's promised to his ancestors. Yeah. So last week we ended with the conversation with he and his wives in which they are in full support of leaving. And they seem about as frustrated with their own father as he is. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, where that, we pick up. And it, isn't that the, the real impetus? The, the, the women say, it's time to go. <laughs> time to go. Yeah. And uh, so here's where we pick up. So this is verse 17. Text says, so Jacob arose and set his children and his wives on camels. And he drove away all his livestock, all the property that he had gained, the livestock and his possession that he had acquired in Padam Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean, and that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. Starting out, he crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he caught his kinsfolk with him. So he took his kinsfolk with him and pursued him for seven days until he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, Take heed that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. (laughs) Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsfolk camped in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You've deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. Why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? What you have done is foolish. It's in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Take heed that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. Even though you had to go because you longed greatly for your father's house, why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. But anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsfolk, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Mm -hmm. Now, probably stop there for now. We kind of see where this story is headed. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is the whole journey, Haran all the way down to the Holy Land, but we'll zoom in here. So basically what it says is that he left Haran He crossed the Euphrates River, and he headed to the hill country of Gilead. Now, you know, it doesn't show up on this map, but I'm pretty sure that's this area here, Mm. I think. He was trying to cut the corner, huh? It it could be here, though. (laughs) See, you know, I'm more used to remote Gilead, which is down here. Um, Mm. And so maybe I'm thinking this is the direction, but I don't think he would have taken this route. I think probably this route is the right one, and he's headed to here. Mm. I'm guessing that that's, you know, remote Gilead is out here. It's further south, but I don't think he could possibly in seven days get from Haran to here. Yeah. So, and of course it just says he's pointing, but this, we at least know the one definable geographical thing is that he did cross the Euphrates river Mm. before he caught him. So that's about where we are on the map. Yeah. Well, the the other curious thing is, is, is that in a, you know, um, Laban is, God speaks to, to Laban. Yeah. And you would think, you know, maybe I didn't say this before, but you would think that, that if, if God spoke to Abimelech and if he spoke to, to Laban like this directly, that they wouldn't have any other gods. 
you, know, you would think, uh, <laughs> you know, but then, but then, it, then yeah, all this, of a sudden, it's a huge revelation that they have household gods, right? We didn't know this. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, so, so maybe, maybe in, in some ways they, they felt as though the household gods pointed to, to, to God. And, uh, but point is, is God speaks directly to him, tells him, don't, 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 uh, don't lay a finger on Jacob right. kind of thing, or don't say anything good or bad. That's like, uh, I'm not sure what that exactly means. Cause he yeah, gets see, there, there's he a says, lot for doing? us. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot for us to figure out here yeah, because, um, mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, we'll do it one thing at a time. Sure. Right. First, sure. they've got gods. Now, that's not surprising. It's surprising to us because we are thinking now of Abraham's family as monotheistic. At least that's that's the general caricature that we would have of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And we would think that the reason he wanted to marry back into his family in Haran is because maybe they shared his beliefs. We already know it came to us a little bit out of order, but we did find out eventually that it was actually Abraham's father who was called to go to Canaan. And they left Ur to go in that direction, but it stopped in Haran and never continued the journey. And then Abraham is, is called to continue it. So there might be a sense that maybe his family is getting to know this God. So to find out that um, all this time they are polytheists, mm -hmm. it might be surprising for the average reader. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't be surprised by that. First, Abraham grew up in Ur, which was a polytheistic culture. Secondly, God speaks to him and tells him to trust him. But God never requires him to believe that there are no other gods. Only that this is the God he needs to follow. And at this point, God hasn't revealed to him that he is greater than all the other gods. Or that, you know, he's created everything. Like, at least in, in terms of what has been narrated to Abraham. In the text, mm -hmm. God has not revealed everything that eventually will be revealed, say to Moses, the Israelites, and then, of course, later to us. So there's, there's a, it's perfectly reasonable to believe that Abraham might have even remained a polytheist. He just knew that this was the God to whom he was to be loyal. Mm -hmm. So he certainly thinks of Yahweh. He doesn't know that name yet. Um, but he certainly thinks of the God as we know God as more important mm -hmm. than the other gods in his case. Yeah. Good. But he may think of it as the God of Abraham. So the fact that his brother, or not his brother, this would be his nephew, mm -hmm. right? Abraham's nephew. Yeah. yeah, it's Abraham's nephew, right, Laban? He's not a great nephew, right? I think he's a direct nephew. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that he might still be a polytheist and yet still believe in this God of Abraham, that probably shouldn't be that surprising. That's probably the reality. And so the mm -hmm. fact that they're worshiping these other gods, surprising to us, but maybe if we thought about it, not that surprising. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, certainly true. I mean, they're, they're you know, um, I mean, and they're, the, the main distinction is that he speaks to him. Get, you get the impression that these other gods are just, just like a one-way street. You, you worship them and they, you kind of appease them, that kind of thing. And, and, and uh, you know, um, they're not, they're, they don't interface you with, it, with you the same way. I mean, right. to, I mean, you would think that if he, he didn't respect them, that he would, that he, he wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be said, said that he spoke to him, you know, it'd be right. like, So God comes to, let's look at this language. This is verse 24. Comes to him in a dream by night and says, take heed that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. Two things come to mind. What does that mean? And secondly, does he obey? Yeah, because he certainly doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it. It's like, hey, man, why yeah. don't you, what are you doing to me? Is what he says. Now, right. Now I would say that that would probably be more along the question of the, the bad, the bad, not necessarily the good. Yeah. You know, but uh, that's, yeah, I, I think, it, I think that's really, I want to look this up in Hebrew you, you um, think, because you think God was telling them, Hey, don't you lay a hand on them? Not, not necessarily. Don't, don't, uh, don't talk to them. Interesting. It, it does say not to speak to him. Yeah. 
and that that may be it may be the uh you know, like some people don't don't speak a word to them about this. I, I think as I'm looking at the Hebrew, and I don't have time to translate every single word, just what I what I can see there. It sounds to me like he's more um, telling him not to do anything substantive. You know, I th I think I um, think he's he, don't condemn him, don't threaten him, don't say you'll bless him, or don't deter him, maybe because yeah. Because he's got to, he's got to go where he's got to go. But this good or bad, this helpful or harmful, mm. I, it sounds to me like don't bless him or threaten him. Mm. I think that's essentially it. Um, what is implied there? I'm looking at it very quickly in the Hebrew, but I think that's my first glance at it. I'd say that the prohibition is don't threaten to to hurt him and don't promise to bless him. And you might have the sense of what you're saying. Don't negotiate with him. Don't try and entice him to come back and, and with violence or with blessing. Either way, that might be what's behind it. But yeah, yeah it's interesting how it's translated in English, though, right? You read that and go, well, he's not supposed to talk to him. And then he goes on and talks to him a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, total, <laughs> totally. Like you know, why'd you leave? And so, I just, I just steal my gods. You know. Yeah. So why does God give that prohibition to Laban? I mean, he could. It seems to me like if I were Jacob and I had a say, I might say, "Could you, could you be stronger than that?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why does is this the prohibition? Don't, don't, don't promise to bless him or threaten to hurt him. Don't, don't make any. Don't give him your word for good or for bad. Is he, he's yeah. barring, what is, what is God barring and why not a stronger statement? Yeah, I think, I think uh, it's just trying to, you know, if we, if we look back a little bit and we say, well, Laban was negotiating with him a lot or trying, trying to, to manipulate him or control him. I, I think it ultimately, you know, um, you know, God is, God is, well, I think, I, I just say, I think he's saying, you know, don't don't try to persuade him to come back here or, or do do what you really want him to do. And that then that's to stay behind and yeah. and uh, and make you rich kind of thing. Oh, yeah. uh, but uh, in the same token, you know. Um, well, and we know that Jacob. I mean, whether Laban has a right to feel this way, and maybe he does. He Jacob was definitely leaving because he didn't want to have this conversation, right? Right. That's why he left in the night, or in and the why way. he waited for Laban to be out shearing his flocks. His three would have sheep, taken a yeah. long time. <laughs> his three sheep. No, I think he had a lot of flocks. <laughs> He's got three, three left after Jacob took them all. Yeah. <laughs> took yeah. them all in fifteen minutes, you know. <laughs> but you know, so I think the Lord is more, more or less saying, "You're not going to make any agreements here with Jacob." Yeah. You know. So. So he, he claims, he says to Jacob, why did you steal out in the middle of the night? I would have given you a great party. Do you, do you buy that? No. No, this guy's would, lying through. I would, have, I would have offered you to work another 14 years. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I would have said, I don't think anybody who's seen the story this long knows that there's not going to be any party and, and send them out. And he claims it's all about his grandchildren right. and his daughters, yeah. right? And... Uh, but there's only one thing he, he objects to, and that's what I want to dig in on. Yeah. He's like, I would have sent you a party, first of all. I would have given you a great send-off. And secondly, I would have at least got to say goodbye to my grandkids and my daughters. But here's what really sticks in my craw, Jacob. Where did my household gods go? Right, yeah. Why <laughs> this you is steal the thing them? he points out. Yeah. And Why I, do you I, think he, he emphasizes that? Well, I think, I think you know, it's a... You know, like as if as if you take you take my gods, I don't I don't have I don't have any more of your blessing kind of thing. I don't have anything. I mean, the, Jacob's probably looking at him and says, "I don't care about your gods. I got my own." <laughs> well, I think there is an irony, right? It, the yeah. way the story's been told is Laban learned through divination that he was blessed because of Jacob. Mm. So Jacob's leaving takes God from Laban's household, and it just also so happens that his daughter steals his household gods. Yeah. But there is also the reality that the actual God is with Jacob. Mm -hmm. And so there is an irony there. Mm -hmm. Also, this is probably the one actionable claim Laban has because he can't argue that the kids are his. Jacob legitimately worked for 14 years for his daughters, so he can't claim that they're his. Mm -hmm. 
he can't claim the sheep are his because even though he changed Jacob's wages 10 times, he, these are all legitimately Jacob's sheep. So the one thing that Jacob did take that belonged to Laban were those household gods. So this is one, one claim he actually has. Yeah. And but he it, emphasizes it. But he later, later on, I mean, we read a little further, I think he, he does say that everything was mine. Doesn't he say that? He does. I mean, and, you know, it, but, it, you can't blame the guy. I mean, Jacob <laughs> came with nothing, right? Yeah, 800 miles and he nothing. was dead broke and nothing. And he's leaving rich. So yeah. it's really hard to not believe. And he has. He, it, all these animals that he's now leaving with were born from Laban's animals. Yeah. So, and, and these were his daughters and the originally. Kids. The, so the it's easy to feel like, hey, this is really all mine, but that's not how it works. That's not how marriage works. That's not how this negotiation works, how wages works. Like if you ever work for a guy and you bought a house and you did all this kind of stuff, and then they say, that's really my house because you worked for me and this is all my stuff. It doesn't work that way. Right. You, know, you might feel that way, especially if you have an employee who does better than you do. Yeah, unless you think you own, you own their, your son-in-law. Right. Might, but you could imagine like somebody working and this guy's paying you a small wage and then you invest it and you make a ton of money and he wants to claim that it belongs to him because the investment money was actually his. Mm -hmm. But Jacob worked for this. So you can see, but Laban is, is that kind of a guy. He's covetous. Yeah. He's ambitious. He's very self-centered. And so, of course, he, he sees this as his. Right. People who think that way always do. Yeah, but the real the other question too is, and and we're probably going to get into it too, is what why Rachel felt like she had to take him. Yeah. Did she feel like she was redeeming him, or did she feel like she needed him? Those are yeah. Those are yeah. You know, I wish we could have gotten this from Rachel's perspective, because I don't remember they had said earlier this was before where we started this week, but it was part of last week where she felt like everything that was her father's belonged to them, mm. that somehow they're the rightful heirs. And so is she just trying to steal what she considers to be her rightful birthright? Mm. Or does she worship these gods? And so she feels she wants to have them with, the, is she not sold on the God of Jacob? And she wants to make sure she has some of these familiar gods with her. Right. Or is she just trying to hurt her father? Because another thing we found out is that they didn't much care for him. Mm -hmm. So is, is this just kind of a, I'm going to stick it to dad. I'm going to take his favorite stuff. You know, is this household... Uh, is, is his household gods like stealing somebody today, somebody's baseball card collection or collection of power tools that they value, whatever. Like I'm going to get him. You can't tell. It could be any of those things, right? Mm -hmm. With Rachel. I mean, does one of them sound more likely to you than another? Or can you think of another reason she might've done it? Well, you know, it, it's like, a, and, and, and I know this is a jump, but it, it kind of feels like what happened in Egypt with the, with the gold, you know, it, 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 they took, they took everything that, that, that was, that was of value. Yeah. And so it feels in some ways that I, I don't think she worshiped these guys. I think she was going to make it, melt them down, make some golden rings out of them. Yeah. Or something. Probably I don't worth know. some money. Yeah. I, you know, if I had to guess the way the story's gone, I would guess that this was to hurt Laban. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It feels but like. you also could, and there's another option I didn't throw out, but you could argue this, and I just don't know. Like you and I are talking about this story as we read it through. Who knows? I might feel different next week. <laughs> there might also be a bit of, they're going to say what their husband wants, but they don't really want to leave home. And they know that if they take these gods, their father will chase them down. So there could be a little, this could be the little string that guarantees that there'll be a conversation with Laban before they get to Israel. So, you know, it's well, hard the, for me to know. I wish we could talk to Rachel. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they feel like the location needs, like, like Laban and Jacob are good together, but they need to be in a different location. Yeah. Or, you know, when a husband comes and says, this is what I want to do, and this is what my God's telling me to do, you know, Rachel and Leah might say to his face, oh, yeah, do whatever you want, everything. And then she might say, I'm going to steal these gods, make sure my father finds out. You know, make sure he yeah. follows us. Right. The smoking So gun. it could be that, too. Or it could be just to spite him. Or it mm. could be because she worships these gods. You know? It, yeah. We don't really <laughs> when I was know. a kid, I assumed she was an idol worshiper. 
And that, mm-hmm. why else would you take gods? But, but now that when we start to realize what gods represent, um, there could be a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a type of su- suspicion or, or superstition, I mean. So because of the way I'm inclined to read the story, and of course, it's probably not fair because I'm guessing if you grew up in this culture, you'd feel differently about it than I do looking in on it. But because I want to read the story, believing the, the daughters have a legitimate gripe against their father, which might be completely illegitimate from their perspective. Mm-hmm. I see this as a passive aggressive jab at Laban and at Jacob at the same time. I, I, I just feel like these two women are going to make sure that these two men had a confrontation and Rachel achieved it by stealing something from her father's house. Yeah, this said- reminds me more, less of Egypt and more of Joseph putting the cup into his brother's uh, sacks of wheat later on in his story. Do you remember? Oh yeah. He does that intentionally to tether them to Egypt and to give actionable cause that would cause a confrontation. Joseph does that. And perhaps he learned this from his mother. There you go. Great (laughs) tactic. Great tactic. Yeah. I think this hurts both men simultaneously. It makes Jacob look like a thief. And it guarantees that Laban will pursue, and and it creates this conflict. Uh, it's hard for me to believe, as we've read the story, that Rachel doesn't intend the mess that's caused by it. Yeah, I mean, she definitely, definitely, you know, even even after the birth birth of Joseph, she, you know, she was looking for the next child, and and so if, if there was a way to way to make make Jacob. Uh, uh, just kind of be a little bit on, a little bit on the, on the, on the, what's the right word? Uh, on the O, if we, if, you know, like owing something. Yeah. <laughs> gee, how did those get there? I don't know. <laughs> no, it's a bizarre, bizarre story. And Jacob, of course, makes a very rash vow that we're somewhat fortunate. He doesn't get caught in because this mm-hmm. could have gone really badly, couldn't it? Because he oh, yeah. didn't know she stole those goods. It's the same thing Joseph's brothers do when he says, I'm missing my divining cup. Mm-hmm. And they say, we don't have it. Let whoever has it, he, he can go with you. And they don't realize Benjamin's <laughs> sack it's in. Right. Yeah, right? so uh, so if, if anybody's going to use some wisdom here, don't ever say that. <laughs> don't make these rash vows. Same thing happens to Jeff. The, some, of you, the, some of you remember in the story of Judges when he vows that he'll kill and sacrifice to God whatever comes out of his house. And it ends up being his daughter. Like you just don't make these rash vows. But uh, Joseph is so sure. I mean, I'm sorry, Jacob is so sure here that he's, in, he's pure as the driven snow. His wives would never do such a thing that none of his 11 sons or the or daughters would ever do such. How can he be sure of that? Or the maidservants. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. He's got such an entourage here. How can he make this promise? I guess he figures he can stand to sacrifice anybody who did. But anyway, um, he didn't know it's Rachel. It's actually the wife that he prefers. But where does Laban go first? To look. It, this remember. tells you when you when somebody has stolen something and you go looking, it tells you a lot about who you trust. Mm. <laughs> and do you yeah. notice the story? Yeah. He goes into Jacob's tent first. <laughs> he thinks he's the most likely guy. And then into Leah. And then into the tent of the two maids, Zilpah and Bilha. And he doesn't find them. So he doesn't he doesn't suspect Rachel either. Mm-hmm. But then he go after he leaves Leah's tent, he goes to Rachel's. So she's the last that he looks at. Do you? Can, I, obviously, I'm thinking we should read into that. But do you think I should? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, he definitely Laban, Laban likes Rachel. You know because you know she she was working for him, was doing good good labor and all that, and Leah was was laborsome for her, for him, and he had to obligation of keeping her you know you know so so i think yeah i mean actually going into jacob first okay going in let me let me let me go down this path a little bit with you <laughs> yeah. going into jacob's first yeah he doesn't doesn't definitely doesn't trust jacob 
I mean, uh, I mean, because that you know his name means <laughs> deceiver or supplanter. But Yoga. but also yeah. also Leah. I mean, a- after that, I mean, because because Jacob, if he did steal him, maybe putting him on the the one he doesn't love. Yeah. Or you know, and so so that that makes sense too. You know, but then then the maid servants are just kind of like, yeah, you know, we gotta have, we gotta have babies who are we gotta be in this anyways. We gotta do whatever they tell us to do. So if he plants it among them, who cares? You know, it's like yeah. And of course, he would never expect. Is this where you're headed? That Jacob would have put these with Rachel because right, he wouldn't yeah. want to lose Rachel. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and uh, that you know, so that that's the progression I see. I I think yeah, that makes sense. You know, but. Yeah. But then, of course, so Laban does finally get to Rachel's tent and he searches it and he can't find them. Right. Um, And, you know, this isn't like a house. You know, these are tents. So there's not, you know, a lot of places to hide it. But we find out that Rachel put them in the camel's saddle. Yeah. Sat on them. Right. Now, (laughs) this may be my favorite thing in the story because it is so crafty. And we don't know anything about Rachel, really, yeah, until really. now. I mean, very, very little, except she wants children and she's not having them. Um, but she is a bit crafty. Mm-hmm. Now, Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about in the tent, but did not find them. She said to her father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. So she claims that it's part of her monthly cycle, mm-hmm. which makes her unclean. And that keeps him from checking her camel saddle. That is crafty. <laughs> and so he doesn't yeah. find them. Well, these, 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 these gods got to be kind of small though. They got to be small. Yeah. It can't be, can't be something, some big deal. Yeah. To I don't know. Yeah. You know, this is like stealing her father's coin collection in a way. It sounds like it. You know, yeah. yeah, well, I don't know much about a candle, a camel saddlebag. I, I suppose it could be somewhat hefty, but it's not going to be like towering things. You no, know, obviously it's something you sit on. So, yeah, I mean, unless unless the camel's saddle was like on it, and then you take it off, and you when you're like camping out, that's what you sit on. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I don't still. know either. And it, it could, it could imply that there are, you know, a saddlebag. Mm. you know but in order to search it she would have to actually get off the camel and she's just yeah. insinuated that she's at a certain time of month that he wouldn't want her to get off the camel yeah these definitely aren't ones like that we saw in like the westerns you know where they no, no 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 yeah. these are traveling camels yeah these these, <laughs> right? these are ones where you, you get it takes a, you know they didn't have these nice zippers and latches and stuff probably to hold stuff in and yeah i mean the real the real question is what we want to know is why in the world you know what? What was she? What was she done with them? You know yeah. what was she doing with these things? Yeah, because she doesn't want to give them back. And if she really wanted Jacob to get in trouble, this would be the moment mm-hmm. to to say, "Yeah, I got him." But of course, Jacob's just sworn that uh, whoever. What did he say? Whoever has these things, he says she should be, she'll be killed. Yeah. 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 So maybe maybe at that point Rachel's the game is up and she's like I'm not gonna <laughs> whatever my plan was I'm not gonna show that I have these household gods. I'm not gonna die for these babies. Now I'm gonna be dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, when you read that part where it said it said in the way of the woman, I. <sighs> yeah, th- th- this is a really nice way of translating uh, what is the the monthly cycle. She's she's, it's the time of her menstrual cycle. It just felt to me for a second that it sounded like the Garden of Eden, the passing of a kind of blame, a way of transferring. Uh, uh, obviously, it's 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 a distraction, you know. Yeah, with, uh, yeah. She's she's playing on the cleanliness um, sensibilities of Laban mm-hmm. in that culture. Yeah, and, and sensitivity to to as well, right? I mean. Uh, yeah. I mean, he would He certainly wouldn't call her unclean, but the, uh, you know. But I tell you, Jacob picked the worst possible time, if that were true, to travel. It seems to me that Laban should have seen through that. What kind of a husband 
And mm. now in these days, they don't have the things that have been invented today to oh, help yeah. make this not as inconvenient as it has been throughout human history. But at this time, let's say later in Israel, if this were to happen, a woman was exempted from traveling to the tabernacle, to the temple. She was exempted from making sacrifices. They called it unclean, but it was really just an exemption because mm -hmm. she couldn't possibly travel in this state um, just because of the income. So if, if Jacob were planning his escape, you would not want to plan it during this week if that were true. Yeah. But it'd, be a, it'd be a terrible, terrible yeah, day. He might not have been able to, but... Um, you would have thought if he were going to favor any one of these wives, it would be Rachel. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why they stopped. They maybe. Camped out. I think yeah. she's lying. Yeah. Um, I, I think she's just bald face lying here. And, and Laban doesn't call her on it. Yeah. Well, she stole the goods and she's lying about that. So yeah. it wouldn't be so hard to lie about that too. Yeah. I think if he had thought about it, he might have realized she was lying. He might even suspect it, because I, I don't. I don't ever see in this story that Laban is convinced Jacob doesn't have those gods. <laughs> yeah, it, and he was totally right. Jacob does. <laughs> Jacob does, which makes everything else that follows here <laughs> ironic, because Jacob will go on to protest his innocence when we know now Jacob is innocent. He didn't know anything about it, but they're not innocent. Right. But, and yet, this is what he says, right? Mm -hmm. Jacob became angry and upbraided Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what's my offense? What's my sin that you've hotly pursued me? Although you felt about through my goods, what have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsfolk and your kinsfolk so that they may decide between us two. These 20 years I've been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried and I've not eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn by wild beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. Of my hand, you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. It was like this with me by, by day, the heat consumed me and the cold by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I've been in your house, I've served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you've changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, we're gonna get back to that, right? Had not been on my side. Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Mm -hmm. So there's an irony here because Jacob is in fact guilty of having Laban's stuff. Mm -hmm. But it gives us an occasion to hear a little more of Jacob's experience with Laban that we didn't know fully. Right. Yeah, he definitely explains the injustice. Yeah. Now we didn't... we. We had suspected that, Jacob, you had said this, that his job and the sheep, he was coming home bleary-eyed sometimes after days away, and then they were telling him which tent to go to, and he just went. Mm -hmm. Well, we get some confirmation that you were right about that, <laughs> because Jacob indicates that many nights he was up all night yeah. watching the sheep, right? And we didn't know this, but Laban, if oh, I've worked for people like this. If anything was killed by an animal, which wasn't Jacob's fault, Jacob had to bear the loss. Laban wouldn't. If anything was stolen by day or by night, Jacob had to pay for it, right? Laban didn't pay for it. These are the things he's pointing out. He's, he's basically saying, I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. And that's why I left. Right. And he's got a pretty decent case here. Yeah. And he's also said, I've done well for you because Laban's gotten wealthy too. Right. Maybe not as wealthy as Jacob but he has a lot more than he had when Jacob came. Mm -hmm. Another another reason why I went after him, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, it's, it's interesting when Jacob shares the story of what his life was like working for Laban. I bet you we have a lot of listeners. What? Well, I shouldn't say we have a lot of listeners. We don't have a lot of listeners. But yeah. I'm guessing that there are some of our listeners that might identify with working for people like this, that every mistake becomes your fault, that they dock your pay. That they, they, they feel like anything that goes wrong is never their fault. It's always the fault of the employee. Right. That's the way Laban treated Jacob. And you can imagine why Jacob wanted to abscond as quickly and without notice as he did. Yeah. I'm glad you clarified that because some, some, some of those listeners, the few that they are, might have thought that we might have been accusing them of stealing, stealing from the bosses. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you also know what it's like when you feel you've been taken advantage of that. Some, there are some people who want to get a little vengeance by doing something spiteful. Yeah, right, and it's, yeah. it's almost a little 
trope that uh, somebody might just take something on the, their way out just in spite right. of their the unfairness. They shouldn't do that. Right. And Jacob certainly didn't, but Rachel did. Yeah. But he certainly had a, a rough time. He sure did. Under Laban. And, 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 and I wish, I wish we, like you said before, I wish we knew more about some of Rachel's deal. That, that would have been interesting to, to, to hear the justification. I, I right. think, you know, maybe she, you know, maybe she felt, oh, I, I've only had one child or one son and, you know, this is, this is, this is something. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think. You think there might've been something else. Yeah. And, you know, I, before we move on to what's very interesting, I think there are a couple of applications we should think about. Uh, the first is if you're an employer, learn what not to do from Laban, right? Mm. Because in some ways, if Laban had treated Jacob differently, he might not have run away the way that he did. Mm -hmm. It might have gone differently. But Jacob indicates, and of course, God told Jacob to leave. And God is protecting Jacob, which we can tell because he spoke to Laban to make sure that Laban had the fear of God in him before he met Jacob, right? Laban thinks he would be, he, he's in his rights to murder him, mm -hmm. which is astounding, right? But if you're an employer, just because you pay someone doesn't mean you own them. Mm -hmm. And what they do with what you pay them for their work is not up to you. And it doesn't belong to you, right? If they've worked for it, it belongs to them. Right. Laban doesn't see it that way. Laban almost sees like this whole absconding. The household gods are the least of it. He's, he's, he's presented the whole thing as though the whole thing was a theft. Right. Right. But many, many more of us work for people like this than employ people the way Laban did. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting. Is it to you, Minister Joe, how hard Jacob worked and how ethically for such a tyrannical boss? Yeah. I mean, finally yeah. he quit. After he fulfilled all of his obligations and there was no more left on his contract, he quit. But while he worked for him, despite how unfair the situation was, he worked himself raw. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that's fair? It's fair, no way. <laughs> no, I mean, not fair, but do you think that's a fair reading of Jacob? Am I giving oh, him too much credit? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, and I, I think there's, a, there, there's this theme of desperation too as well. I've talked about that before within the scriptures where, where, where probably Jacob felt like he had no choice. I mean, uh, this, is, this is kind of, kind of what the 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 people that he was told to, that you know his family line Isaac his family line this is what 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 it was to be and so in some ways he, he probably felt trapped uh yeah. felt felt uh you know and and you know the same the same same for employers as, as well as for employees they need to be able to you know this this is not always that easy but you need to be able to stand up and, and negotiate Right. In a fair manner as well, too. I mean, there are there are uh, situations where where employers em, employers feel av taken advantage of by employees yeah. in our culture uh, with Absolutely. all the rights. Yeah, it would be a different story, stuff. right? If that were the case. But do you yeah. see that in in Jacob at all? Do you think he's taking advantage of Laban? Um, I think I think he is. Uh, no, I don't think he's taking advantage of of Laban. I f I feel like like he. He, he within the bounds of uh, the bounds of what his uh, negotiation was that he, he, you know, I don't think he took advantage at all. I think I think leaving leaving in the middle of the night was a necessity for him. I don't think I don't yeah. think Laban would have really gave him a good chance. Um, yeah, I mean, I can kind of see things from Laban's point of view. I'm not saying that I can't because anytime an employee, you would expect that the normal order of things is that the employer will do better than the employee. That's how you would expect it to be. That, that in this relationship, the employer will always end up with a lion's share of whatever is produced. You still see that in our world. You, the CEOs make way more and the presidents make way more than the people in the mail rooms, mm -hmm. right? Or if you're working at, it's the person who owns the mechanic shop is gonna make more than the people who work there. Mm -hmm. That's how you expect. That has been turned upside down in the case of Jacob. Jacob has worked for Laban, but he has profited more than Laban has. Now they both profited 
as that old, was it a Thatcher saying? I don't know, that a rising tide lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. It certainly was true that Jacob had improved, but it wasn't improving in the way he expected where he would remain on top and Jacob would remain underneath. Somehow Jacob had become more wealthy than his employer. Mm -hmm. And that feels like theft to Laban. And it would feel like theft to anybody. If the guy in your mailroom ends up wealthier than your CEO, you're going to say, what's going on here? Something, something squirrely is going on here. This guy's taking money from somewhere. I mean, he doesn't, you know, so it has been upended. Now we know it's been upended by God. It hasn't been because Jacob has been crooked, mm -hmm. but Laban doesn't see it that way. And you can understand why he wouldn't. Yeah. That, that's kind of a current theme though. I mean, not a current theme, but a theme with it, with it, Abraham, with it, with with Isaac, even even in Isaac, where where he was with a Abimelech, and Abimelech tells him to, to you know go away from here because you're getting you're getting to be too making too much, you, yeah. you know, and and so uh, we, we I just read that and dealt with that uh, this last Sunday in a Bible study, mm -hmm. and Abimelech says you're getting too powerful, Lars, move away from us, so you know, so there 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 is that kind of theme. With those who who call on the name of the Lord, they 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 seem like they're the underdog, but yet in in a lot of ways they they succeed, yeah. and and God 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 blesses them and and uh, and then there's the question. This is Abel and Cain all over again. When God favors one over the other, what will the other one do? And Laban is showing that he's very much like Cain. He's very jealous of this. He doesn't trust it. The, the natural order of this relationship has been turned on its head and he doesn't understand how. The only way he can imagine is that something crooked is going on. The truth is it's God doing it and nothing crooked is going on at all, but that's not, Laban can't see that. And so Laban thinks Jacob's the problem. And so he has a reason to accuse him of stealing, which is clear that the household gods are just the tip of the iceberg. This is his actionable thing, but he suspects Jacob's been pillaging him since the day he came, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, what is Cain going to do? Well, Cain decides that he's going to settle the Abel problem by murdering him. And that same thing might have been in Laban's heart, but right. God intervenes with Laban. And remember, he intervened with Cain as well. He, 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 he stopped Cain in his tracks and said, hey, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you, but you must master it. And of course, yeah. Cain doesn't, is not deterred by this. He continues yeah. on the track he was going. Laban, God doesn't give him a moralism or a moral lesson. He doesn't try to improve him like he did Cain. He just says, you're not going to do what you're thinking you're going to do. Yeah, a bit more specific though. I mean, with Cain and Abel, he doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, he says sin is crouching at your door, but it doesn't necessarily say you're going to kill your brother. Right. So, so maybe it's a little bit more specific in this instance with Laban, uh, even though uh, it's not labeled as sin. He says you're not. You're not going to. You're not going to talk to him, good or bad. So. But well, Laban does. He leads with, I had a right to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you wonder what's in his heart. Um, yeah. But yeah, so these themes continue to wrestle. And anytime somebody is blessed. He must have felt that that was a neutral position. <laughs> I guess, yeah. He didn't think that was what God was prohibiting, apparently. Um, or he didn't care. I, I can't tell with Laban yet. But, yeah, he's, um, he's, but anytime somebody's blessed, and we're not. That's the position of Laban. We'll do this from Laban's position first. Anytime that somebody is blessed and we're not, we want to come up with a reason that their blessing is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And that's, Laban has created this story in his mind clearly, because every time he talks to Jacob, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. that Jacob has pretty much been a con man and he has stolen everything that mattered from Laban and enriched himself. And now he wants to leave. That's the story Laban has told him. He can't believe that God is blessing Jacob. I mean, he kind of knows it. Mm -hmm. He already said he learned it by divination. But he seems to have another story that's dominating. When somebody else is being blessed and we're not, whether it's Cain and Abel, whether it's Laban and Jacob, whether it's Isaac, uh, whether it's Isaac and Ishmael, whether it's Jacob and Esau, whether it would be Joseph and his brothers, anytime somebody is favored and we're not, the story over and over again is that we get jealous, we get envious, we get covetous, and then we, we want to see them knocked down. Mm -hmm. 
that is always presented as the, a bad example in the scriptures. It's never the, yeah. never the way to go. So Laban, as reasonable as his concerns are, he's being painted as a negative character. He's following in the line of Cain. Mm -hmm. As reasonable as it seems, he's following in the line of Cain. Now, on the other end of things, if you're the one who's blessed, it should be very clear that Jacob isn't blessed because he's smarter than Laban. He's not blessed because he's craftier than Laban. He's not blessed because he's worked harder than Laban. God is the one blessing him. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be um, humility when that blessing comes. I'm not sure that Jacob is great at that yet. Yeah. He is with his wives. He confesses that it's God who gave him the idea with the sheep, that it's God who made sure that the sheep always produced what he needed. So he does give God the credit. But here with Laban, he gets defensive, and he lays out all of his resume. Yeah. I think the wound's still pretty sore with Laban. That's why Jacob, Jacob's, you know, it, it feels really personal when, when he's confronted that way. When somebody says, you, I could have killed you. Uh, he said that's a he defends uh, himself, and I'm not saying he's wrong to defend himself. Yeah, he's justifying basically the accusation. He's defending himself against the accusation that he is a thief, mm -hmm. that he's enriched himself at Laban's expense, and that he's exp absconded with the booty. Mm -hmm. He he's more or less defending himself and saying that's not the case at all. And I'm not saying it's wrong to defend himself. Yeah, right. But if God hadn't intervened and warned Laban this would have gone badly. Yeah, I kind of picture Laban with it, with his hand on the sword, you know, on the hilt there. You know, I could have killed you, you know, and... and uh, well, and Jacob basically says, the reason God warned you is because he's on my side. Mm -hmm. That he, I mean, that's, that's quite a card to drop. Yeah, it's confidence too. Yeah, and I don't think it would have worked if God hadn't, appeal, hadn't appeared to Laban. Right. Right, he would have said, oh, yeah, you know, I know God spoke to you because you took him with it. He <laughs> took my gods with you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but Laban, Laban is now going to lay out the rest of his case, and that's what I've been anticipating. In verse 43, he says, the daughters are my daughters. Right. The children are my children. The flocks are my flocks. Right. Yeah. All that you see is mine. But what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about their children whom they've born? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone, set it up as a pillar. We've seen him do this before. Yeah. And Jacob, did he sleep on this one? And Jacob said to his kinsfolk, gather stones. They took stones, made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it and I'll do my best without seeing the Hebrew. It's very hard in English for me. Jagar Sahodutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he called it Galid and the pillar Mizpah. For he said, the Lord watch between me and you when we are absent from one another. Mm -hmm. If you ill treat my daughters, or if you take wives in addition to my daughters, though no one else is with us, remember that God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, see this heap and see the pillar, which I've set between you and me. This heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. Mm -hmm. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So here Jacob repeats this. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And Jacob offered a sacrifice on the height and called his kinsfolk to eat bread. And they ate bread and tarried all night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban rose up, kissed his grandchildren, his daughters, and blessed them. And then he departed and returned home. So here Laban lays out the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You've stolen from me, but there's nothing I can do about it. Which is true. Rachel even took the household gods, but he can't find the proof. Right. So Laban is more or less saying, you have pilfered me. And I, I have, I have, there's nothing I can do. Nothing left. So let's make a covenant. Mm -hmm. We're not going to cross this line. Yeah. Here's a, here's the line in the sand. You go your way. I'll go mine. You won't come back to me and I won't go after you. So he sets that up. Right. Mm 
But here twice when Jacob is making promises, he calls God the fear of Isaac. Mm -hmm. So before we get to Laban any further, we should probably stop and think about that. He's the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac. This is unusual language. It's not used later. Mm -hmm. When God appears to Moses, he says that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say he's the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But the fear of Isaac will, will be here for Jacob. Why? <laughs> he's the God, the God who says I'll, that he'll slay you. <laughs> yeah, and the word here in Hebrew is pachad, pachad, which means to dread, um, to be so terrified that you're not fit for action. Mm. If person, it can be used for trembling. Um, sometimes of a religious awe. When I think, when I think of the fear of, uh, of Isaac, I think of him on the altar, tied up. That's what I think of. I know. I, I cannot hear this nomenclature and not think that Isaac had, uh, the way Isaac presented God to Jacob was a fearful God. Yeah. I think Isaac was a hellfire and brimstone preacher to his children. Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, that's Jonathan how it feels Edwards. to me. And I, I'm guessing it, you're right. It's because of Mount Moriah. Like this is a God who asked Abraham to kill him. And he watched his father raise the knife to his throat. I think that's not going to put the fear of God in you. I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah. Isaac's relationship with God, we've already, already said, was unusual. And his relationship with his sons is unusual. But this, this way of talking of Isaac's relationship with God kind of seals the deal for me that Isaac's relationship with God, Jacob saw, was different than Abraham's. Do you think they sat around the table a few times and he says, kids, boys, you know what it feels like to be on that altar? I know. When I was your age, my father was walking me up to Mount Moriah, and I had to carry the wood myself. <laughs> Both ways, no. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I, it, it obviously, um, Jacob, and Jacob doesn't really trust God. Remember we said that early on? Like in Bethel, he makes a, de a deal with God. If you'll take care of me, then you'll be my God. Yeah. And I think, you know, whatever Isaac passed down, he, he passed something down that made Jacob suspicious of God's motives and made Jacob think of God as primarily a fearful image mm. for his dad. Mm. So, you know, Jacob, it's, it's just very, very interesting. Yeah, it's also, also a, a degree of negotiation in some ways because it's like the, the anxiety that that Jacob might have had to keep him around the tents might have been that very fear of going up on the mountain. Uh, or or it was it was very clear that if you stayed around the tents, it, I'm talking about when he was back at home, yeah. um, there's that assurance that, that you'll be taken care of. And so out in the open here, like at Bethel there, uh, he wanted that assurance. And then with the realization that he was going going there with nothing yeah i mean i think i think if you're going to ask for ask for wishes those those kind of those are good things yeah but uh yeah i agree i and i think the negotiation makes sense especially given jacob's experience he wasn't esau he wasn't an adventurer he wasn't you know he was more like you said he was accustomed to being taken care of and and um maybe doing hard work because shepherding is no joke yeah. but but certainly not the same kind of um, all by yourself, no food, nothing around, trying to care for yourself. So it's understandable he would make that negotiation. But Abraham had learned to trust God in a way it looks to me like Isaac didn't and didn't pass down that to his children. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah. It, Though it, each generation does have to learn it on their own. So maybe I'm being too hard on Isaac. But this idea that he would call God the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, makes it look to me like uh, that's telling us something about Isaac's relationship and the way that he explained God to his children. Yeah. And I think, I think also that more than likely Laban had no respect for Isaac because here, you know, here, here he sent a servant to come get it, come get it, his, his, his sister, Rebecca. So there might've been like, you know, like, you know, he's not even a real man. 
<laughs> yeah, I wonder, because, you know, it's interesting. Abraham sent his servant with money to pay for a dowry so that they could take Rebecca, but Jacob came with nothing yeah. and had to work for 14 years. So it's hard for that not to reflect on Isaac. Right. Well, what did yeah. he squander all Abraham's wealth? He sends his son penniless to me. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah. So the so the respect from from Laban, I think, is low for for Isaac. So so to accentu accentuate the fear of of Isaac, sounds sounds like he's a tough guy, but but in reality, it's if we really know what he, what the fear of Isaac is, mm -hmm. it's it's you know. We we think of Moriah, but but in some ways Isaac did get rich. He did he did become yeah. somebody somebody big in that area. I mean got his own well and uh you know well and as you're talking about this i wonder if if calling him the fear of isaac was a way to amplify the fear in laban yeah that's what i'm getting at i yeah. think yeah you, you said it more wonderfully <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i could see that's where you're headed yeah. yeah so um <clears throat> it's it's interesting the dynamics going on here um and i like this covenant it's an interesting covenant usually covenants have some sort of you do this for me i'll do this for you but this is a lot like the abimelech covenant isn't it yeah don't come around here no more <laughs> yeah yeah you stay on your side i'll stay on my side yeah but i like the helplessness i don't know why i like the helplessness of laban where he's like oh, i know you've cheated me but there's nothing i can do about it <laughs> like he just he will not accept the fact that god has blessed jacob yeah he will not confess that as far as he's concerned, he has been cheated. He just doesn't know how, and there's nothing he can do. Yeah. And at least when it comes to his household gods, he's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, story to consider, and there's so much uh, trickiness. I guess uh, as I think about how to wrap it up for me, and then I'll let you wrap it up for you. I think I'm just constantly interested in the fact that, so J.R.R. Tolkien is credited with a quotation. I don't know where he said it. It wasn't in, it wasn't in the Lord of the Rings or, or anything I've read by him. So mm -hmm. maybe he didn't say it. Maybe it's, it's a fictional attribute, attribution, but it's usually associated with him. Which of God's blessings are not also his curses? And it's an interesting comment, whoever said it. I think it was Tolkien, though. Um, it's interesting that you can't win for losing in this world. Jacob came to Laban penniless. He made Laban rich. But he also got rich. And because he's been blessed, Laban hates him. And Laban thinks he's been defrauded. And it's interesting that that happens throughout. Abraham has the same problem with Abimelech, and so does Isaac. They get so prosperous that the people hate them. They fear them. Like as soon as God blesses, it creates enemies. Mm -hmm. But if you're not blessed, like Jacob wasn't early on, right? He was penniless after traveling 800 miles coming into Laban. He yeah. gets abused and taken care of. So the yeah. wealth provides him protection, but also gains him an enemy. Right. You know, it's it's... As I think about the Cain and Abel story, I think it, this just plays out over and over again. God mm -hmm. blesses someone, somebody else hates that person. And that person becomes their enemy because God has blessed them. If God doesn't bless them, then they become the one envious of somebody else. There's mm -hmm. just no winning, right? I think that's why the best idea we've ever had on earth for peace is to make everybody rich. I mean, that's essentially Star Trek. I love Star Trek, but that's essentially it. They create something called a... Uh, uh, well, now I'm, I'm losing all of my Star Trek references now because I've been so immersed in the Bible. It's a good thing. But they make a replicator uh, yeah. where you can just use energy to create anything. So you want a bow, you want a gun, you want food, you want whatever. It's just fabricated out of nothing. It, you know, you just have to pay for the replicator. And so everybody can be brought to the same level of wealth. And there's no longer any need to be envious. That's our best idea. That's almost the American experiment. If everybody had what they needed, nobody would be jealous of anybody. It's almost like saying the solution to Cain and Abel, God, is if you would just have liked them both the same. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, if you yeah. just would have accepted both of their sacrifices, everything would have been fine. It's this constantly that one has more than another, one is liked more than another, one pleases you, one doesn't, it causes all the problems. Right. Like, and so our best solution is make sure everybody is the same. And if everybody is the same, we'll abandon envy. But I'm constantly reminded when I read this story that that's not the way God has designed the world. Mm -hmm. That, that there are ups and downs, that there are seasons in which one person is favored and not another, and then that can reverse. That God's created the world this way. And James, when he addresses it, he doesn't say the problem is inequity. He says the problem is envy. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me that over and over again, the story of Cain and Abel never stops being replayed. And we keep thinking the solution is not the solution the scriptures offer. Mm. The solution is right, Cain becoming willing to accept his shortcomings, his failures, to own it, to master it, and to leave Abel alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that, that probably would have been a better solution, but humans keep thinking we need to take from those who have more we need to make everything the same that's yeah. not the story we have here right i you know I, I wish i could say more than more than that but that's just the way it feels it feels like all of our best solutions to how to solve the interpersonal problems and that the bible just doesn't give us a solution to them jesus teachings keep aiming at each of us mm -hmm. well you need to deal with your envy you need to deal with your covetousness you need to mm -hmm. deal with your lust you need to do, you know it's it's all pointed at us and we keep thinking no you just have to fix the environment and i'll be a better person right yeah but it's never that so jacob's blessing becomes a curse but it will be a blessing soon it's a curse to laban it'll be a blessing though um to, it, it helps him buy back esau's affection <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know>? yeah <laughs> so anyways least... i know i'm kind of rambling there but i i hope at least our listeners and maybe you minister joe see the the territory i'm wandering around in go, go better the the struggle we have in our culture is this this sounds a lot like prosperity gospel or right you know that that that's what we struggle with a lot of times it is but, yeah and we have to realize that the covenants god makes with people he's going to fulfill and the covenant he makes with jacob is one for protection and prosperity it's necessary because god needs to establish a people through whom he will speak yeah. Um, and deliver his truths to others. And in order to do that, he has to make space for them on the earth because the people of the earth have crowded everything out and they've claimed every place. And so there's no way now to get a place without some sort of attrition or battle, which the Israelites are going to have to fight later on. But mostly that's because the people claim every place. It's like people, people just will not be content where they are. They spread to everywhere. I mean, look, is there any place in the United States that somebody doesn't stake a claim now? whether it's the federal government or the state governments or individual people, like there's all the properties claimed, you know, it's the same thing. And if God wants to start somebody, he's going to, so it's, it's just a different kind of covenant. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that we're under the new covenant of Jesus mm -hmm. and the stipulations. It's not that the ethics or the values of previous covenants are not still in play because they are, but the specific stipulations and the blessings and the curses are made with all who will come to faith in Jesus by Jesus. And he just doesn't promise prosperity for all who follow him. Now, God can make an individual covenant with somebody if he wants to. But the general covenant made with us is, is eternal life, the new heavens and the new earth, peace and a relationship with God on earth, freedom from our sins. These are given to all who follow Jesus. But it's not about material prosperity in the new covenant. Right. But it was for Jacob partially that. So we would expect he has to be blessed. That's part of God's agreement. It's not his agreement with you and me. Unless he's made a covenant with you, Minister Joe, I don't know anything about. It's certainly not part of the covenant of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, again, God makes covenants. And God behaves within the strictures of that covenant. And it's very important. One of the most important questions you can ask yourself is, what, what covenant has God made with me? Mm -hmm. And he's going to be faithful to the covenant he's made. And the general covenant that we all live under, who, have, who are Christians, is the covenant of Jesus. And we're reading the book together as a congregation, if you want to see what the stipulations and promised blessings and curses of that covenant are, because Matthew is very much designed to say, mm -hmm. 
And unfortunately, it says, blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the men. Unfortunately, it's a different covenant than Jacob's. <laughs> yeah. And, all, and also, Jesus was talking to people who were, who were in, in, in oppression. I mean, if you were, you were to talk to Jacob when he, would, when, when he was just starting out the seven years, I think he had a little bit of a different, different tone after the, after the 20 years of, of, of his, his self-esteem or his own situation. Yeah. And, and I think as a Christian, sometimes we, we, we see that we, we, we see and we feel things differently as we, as we walk in this faith, as we grow in this faith as well. And so, so, uh, you know, I think those, those who, who come, come to Christ expecting to get a lot more and, and, get a lot in the sense materially and, and, and financially and status and jobs and all this sort of stuff. Oh, well, I prayed for a job. So, I, so, I, you know, uh, God's going to bless me with that. Um, or a certain, certain, uh, ca- uh, quality of life. Yeah. Um, I think, I think they're missing we're, the point I'm saying is we're, they're probably missing the point. And, uh, yeah. I'm saying I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is it's perspective in that situation yeah. that helps you to, to interpret that in, uh, and understand it more effectively. If, if you, if you're a Christian, you're, you're experiencing hard times right now. It, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're, that, that God doesn't love you is what I'm trying to say. Right. He may be trying to teach you something or maybe just that you're, you're in a difficult situation. Such as, such as Jacob had, and it was time to go. Yeah, even though Jacob's covenant involved material blessing, he certainly, as you're saying, spent a lot of years suffering. Mm. Um, but I still want to make the point that the covenant of Jesus does not guarantee the same things that God's covenant with Jacob guaranteed for him. Mm-hmm. Jacob could be sure, even if it took 20 years in the coming, that God was going to bless him because God said he would. Mm-hmm. And and that meant materially and physically. Yeah. Um, and he certainly does. But that's because God promised that. Now, for mm-hmm. a Christian, we are not promised that if we just wait long enough, we will get material blessing. That's not the covenant of Jesus. That's not what he says. Right. Uh, but we are promised eternal life. We are promised forgiveness of our sins and freedom from the tyranny of sin. These right. things are promised in the covenant of Jesus. Now, if you ask somebody, what would you rather be, Minister Joe? Rich or free from the tyranny of sin? Mm-hmm. Sadly, what I see in the church is most Christians preferring the money mm-hmm. and wanting to be under the covenant with Jacob. But the New Testament, particularly Hebrews, indicates that the promises made to us are by far of greater value. Yeah. Than theirs, but we don't see it that way. Oftentimes. Yeah. But I can I, say, you know, there have been times in my life where Jen and I um, were doing very poorly financially. I mean, I would say that's the majority of our life. You know, it's, you know, things come and go, but there have been at least twice where we sold everything we had mm-hmm. and went where God wanted us to go penniless. Mm-hmm. Um, and in those seasons, it does often feel like we were abandoned. Mm -hmm. It just feels that way. You know, we knew it wasn't, that couldn't be true, but it feels that way. It's easier. I'm sure Jacob felt that way for 20 years. Yeah. Feels raw. But there, the truth is that there are experiences of some Christians in the world and many of the saints of the church who never got out of that season. Mm -hmm. Who, who were hungry, and thirsty, exposed to the elements, persecuted, and then executed, mm. and never got to see any of the physical benefits of, of God's good creation while they lived in this world. You yeah. think of Paul, you think of, um, you know, you can think of a, a number of people, depending on the season that you live in, like if you were trying to get the scriptures printed before the Protestant Reformation in the language of the people. Yeah. You think of the, the, the suffering that they endured. Yep. Um, so what I, I just want to make sure that we're clear, Jesus is not breaking promises when people have those experiences. Mm-hmm. He hasn't made those promises. Right. But right. To, to Jacob, he did. Mm-hmm. So it's yep. important that he fulfill the promise to Jacob, which he does. 
Yeah. Yeah. And when I say a prosperity, I don't simply mean like cash money, though it can be yeah. that. I mean security, safety, yeah. um, health. Right. For a lot of people, like they'd rather be healthy than wealthy. Right. Though most people seem to want for both, yeah. um, as we all do. None of us want to suffer. Right. I mean, there's something psychologically wrong with a person who's actually looking forward to suffering. Like that's yeah. diagnosable, <laughs> but yeah. you got problems. <laughs> but I want to be clear on what covenant we're under, yeah. and of course, God made promises to Jacob at Bethel that God saw through, and so we have to celebrate that. But mm -hmm. but because He made those promises to Jacob, doesn't mean He made them to you or to me. Um, Jesus makes His covenant, and I, I do find a great many preachers today. They don't much care for the covenant stipulations Jesus laid down, and so they prefer to go mm -hmm. back to Moses. Yeah. yeah. And so you have a lot of retreats to Moses uh, in people who just don't like the conditions of the covenant Jesus laid out. What do you mean? Yeah. Deny yourself daily, take up your cross and follow me. I don't know. Blessed are those who suffer. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who mourn. That, I don't know. I think I kind of like Sinai better. I mean, granted, it made a lot more restrictions on me. I had to do this and this and this and this. But as long as I did it, then I was going to get crops. I was going to have children. I was going to be safe from my enemy. I think I'd prefer that covenant. The problem is you don't get to choose mm -hmm. the covenant God makes with you. Right. And Paul tries to tell us in Galatians that however good that covenant started, it became a curse and you don't want it anymore. <laughs> you know, because the blessings are gone, man. It's only the curses that are left, according to Paul. Right. So, true. yeah, I mean, this discussion is a little bit harder, but I think you brought it up for good reason. Because when we... Wow, Sorry about that, that stuff. The Bible yeah, fall. That's great. That was just, brilliant. The walls of Jericho just fell. Sorry about that. But I think you bring it up for a good reason. I think sometimes you read these things and we think that Jacob's destiny is all of our destiny, that if we work hard, God guarantees that we'll see the fruits of our labor. Sadly, that's not the new covenant of Jesus. Many of us don't see the fruits of our labor, and it's not because God is being faithless or because he doesn't love us. Uh, it's because we're under a different covenant. Mm -hmm. But we do trust that the blessings of the new heavens and the new earth will be given to all of us mm -hmm. who put our faith in Jesus. And so we can endure this world. Jacob is under a different agreement with God for a very different purpose. Mm -hmm. We just have to accept that. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to live in a tent either. Do you? No, but we <laughs> may have to like, this is the thing you don't know. I, I mean, most of the things that I uh, know, I won't say most, a great many of the things that have happened to be in my life. I would not have chosen if I had been given a choice. Right. Certainly would not. I would never have chosen to leave my hometown myself. I never wanted to do that. I certainly would not have chosen to have cancer. There are several ministry jobs that I've had that I would not have chosen if I didn't feel the Lord was telling me that this is what he wanted me to do. I, this career itself, I wouldn't have chosen. <laughs> you know. But the thing is, that's life. You don't get to make the choices, but you get yeah. to choose how you how you live in the midst of them. And that I think we can learn from Jacob because he was in a very bad circumstance for 20 years. Oh, yeah. and he was a stand-up guy. Yep. He worked hard to the full maximum of his ability. He never stole. He never cheated, even though he was being cheated. That's at least what he says. And we have nothing in the text that would tell us that he's wrong about what he says. Of course, he didn't know his wife stole, but different story. Yeah, that's a different conversation about about communication between spouses. Yeah, it, is important. it surprising to you at all, Minister Joe, that he didn't know what Rachel did? Oh, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. Yeah, me neither. The way these yeah. this marriage these marriages went. Yeah, the the, the you know, I, I yeah, it was it was a quite a peculiar situation. I mean, it, I mean, we saw the similar things in, with with Sarah and Sarah and. Uh, and Abraham and even Isaac and Rebecca. So it's not, a, yeah. it doesn't seem uncommon that, that they don't talk as much. And, it, and it, it's, I think it's worthy to say that, that, that how important it is to talk as, as, uh, in, as married couples and that don't think that they already know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Jacob, there, there's certainly the kind of marriage that we aspire to in our culture is, is not, 
evidenced here very well. But I, I had mentioned to you before we started recording that I've just rewatched Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. And uh, the scene of him, as, of Rev Tevia asking his wife if she loves him mm. is such an interesting scene, especially for those of us who are wrestling with the difference between love as it's defined in the West as this romantic glandular experience for the most part, <laughs> and chesed, which is this loyalty, right? Tevia says to his wife, do you love me? because his kids are enamored with love and it's all glandular for them. What they mean is they're attracted to each other. They have warm tingles and they, you know, whatever. Um, and he's asking her, do you love me? And she's like, it's such a great scene because she doesn't even know what he's talking about. She's like, I've been married to you for 20, 28 years mm -hmm. or whatever, however long it is. And, and he says, yeah, but do you love me? And she says, I wash your clothes. I cook your food. <laughs> You know, yeah. What she's saying is, love is the things I do for you. It's chesed. It's, I've been faithful. What do you mean, do I love you? But he's asking her if she loves him the way that these kids love each other. Yeah, of course. And she's never even thought about it. Yeah. So she's, she, you know, it's a great scene. And then finally she thinks, I think I love you. You know, that's kind of the conclusion. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, I think I love you. And then they say at the, at the end, at the close, it's like, after all these years, it's nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't even know each other when they got married yeah so so marriage is an entirely different thing even in that culture which was in you know early 20th century russian jewelry mm -hmm. let alone this middle eastern culture so you know you and i don't have a good line of sight on what is not healthy in this mm -hmm. relationship because what healthy look like in this time is nothing like what we would think healthy looks like today yeah but we know from the biblical record that what was expected in marriage was faithfulness, was chesed, and loyalty to each other, mm. and a certain way of relating to each other that was consistent with the cultural values. One thing I will say is I would suspect even in this culture, Rachel would be seen as a poor spouse because she did this to her husband without his knowledge and put him at risk. Mm. So there is something off to me with Rachel. Mm -hmm. But Leah, the one he doesn't like as much, she seems to be what you would want a wife to be in these days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hard for you and I to say what's healthy. You, you say they should have talked more. And I would say, yes, if they lived in America today, they would be in therapy, yeah. for conflict resolution, and for communication skills. That's worth <laughs> Imagine what family family therapy would be with with that family. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> but we're looking at it through twenty first century eyes. Oh yeah. In the West, yeah. right? But what I what I see here, trying to think about it from their perspective, I would think a reader in these days would have a problem with Rachel's lack of chesed. Mm. And and uh, that's the one place I would say in this culture they need work. Yeah. Rachel, Rachel just put her whole family at risk for some unspoken motive. Yeah. Seems like a Bonnie and Clyde kind of, kind of move. Seems like an Esau thing where mm -hmm. for some food, he sacrifices his birthright. Mm -hmm. Rachel yeah. almost sacrificed her whole family for a few household gods that fit under a camel saddle. Right. So, so there is something mm -hmm. to say here that this is, not a good marriage, but probably by different criteria than you and I would use. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, technically she could have, that could have called down a whole genocide. Oh, it would have been awful if he had found those idols, huh? Yeah. 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 Any final words, Minister Joe, before we wrap it up for another week? I think that's about it. And I'm, I appreciate you guys listening to us and having this conversation and uh, talk about it with somebody else. Share it a little bit. 